why have I made it this far in ministry? Like when I just evaluate my own life, why have we made it this far as a church? You know, over the last 25 years, I've watched churches start and churches end. I've watched pastors begin in ministry, and I've watched pastors transition out of ministry. Uh, After a season or two, I suspect many of you have witnessed the same thing. Not everybody can stay in something for the long haul. You know, so I find myself this month of our 25 years of ministry asking this question, why am I still in the game, right? What's kept me engaged so long in this thing called pastoral uh, ministry? Well, two weeks ago, as you just saw, Beto, Millie, and I, uh, we took a road trip to Prescott, Arizona to spend some time with Jim and, and Norma in their home there, who are part of our Palm Harvest family. And one of the things that I admire about Jim and Norma, which I, I suspect many of you do too, is their, their zest for life. You know, I know it's frowned upon to uh, talk about a woman's age, and so I'll just mention the fact that Jim's 93, uh, Norma's younger than that. Um, but as I, when I look at their life, you know, I, I, I find myself asking the question, how does a person live with such zest? Would you agree with me that they live their life with vigor? Everybody, yeah, for the most part? Well, as I've thought about that question, what does it Call, call for to live a life with vibrancy into one's 90s, I come back with one word, and we're going to talk about this word today, and it's the word intentionality. To, to live a vibrant life, and especially up into that age, you have to exercise every day, right? You have to be intentional about eating healthy foods and surrounding yourself with positive people. You have to really proactively choose to maintain a positive attitude even when things don't always go your way. Would you, uh, would you say that's true for the two of you? Well, did you know that the same is true for churches? And so when I reflect on Jim and Norma's life, and as I reflect upon the last 25 years of ministry here at Palm Harvest Church, which I've had the privilege of being a part of from the very beginning, there's four lessons I think that God has taught me about living a fruitful life, four things that we're going to talk about today. And so if you have your app, open it up and write this down, point number one in your app notes. Thankful fruitfulness requires, you ready for this? Vine priority intentionality. Thankful fruitfulness requires vine priority intentionality. Now you say, Pastor Mike, what do you mean by that? Well, let me explain. If you have a Bible with you today, whether it's in paper or digital form, I want you to turn to the gospel of John chapter 15. Here in John chapter 15, Jesus is teaching. He's out on his preaching teaching tour and he, and he uses this farming analogy. Interestingly enough, he uses a, a wine country analogy to talk about what it's involved in living a fruitful life. And what we're going to see here and what he tells us is it requires this this vine priority intentionality. And so if you have your Bible, John chapter 15, I'm going to start reading at verse 1. Notice what Jesus says. He says, I'm the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. So what's the, what's the, what's the translation here? Basically saying Jesus, what Jesus is saying here is, is a fruitful life is going to require a little bit of, of a pruning, which we might translate to say at tough times. In other words, God uses tough times. He allows tough times in our life in order to shape us and in order to really cause our influence in this world to grow. And Jesus is the vine and we're the branches. So skip down to verse 15 or verse five. Yes, Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Those who remain in me and I in, in them might produce much fruit. Is that what he says? Might? No, he says will, right? So if we stay attached to the vine, Jesus says, you will produce fruit. That is a promise. A fruitful life 
a vine priority, intentionality is required for us to, to, to live a, a life of fruitfulness, okay? Now, with that in mind, I want you to go back to two books, to the book of Mark, so the gospel of Mark. So Mark, so if you go back one book, it's Luke, and then if you go back one more book, it's the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark, and in chapter 1, here's the context about what we're going to read. We're going to read some verses here in, in, in Mark chapter 1. People, again, Jesus is out on his, his preaching, teaching tour. And as you're going to notice here in these verses, people are attracted to Jesus' style. If you read chapter 1, you're going to read how people are, are amazed by this supernatural power with which Jesus heals people. And, and it's really no different today. People want to be a part of a winning team. And so if you're a winner, uh, if you're someone who, who kind of you know, broods uh, positivity, people are going to be attracted to you. People are going to be, want to be in your, in your orb, so to speak, and such is the case that we, that we see here. But I want you to notice specifically as we look at verse 35 here in Mark chapter 1, I want you to notice the habit that Jesus practices to make sure that he's not completely overwhelmed by people's needs as they all gather around him to get a piece of him. Look at what we're told here, Mark 1 verse 35. Before daybreak, in other words, before the sun comes up, while it was still dark, maybe your Bibles say, the next morning Jesus got up and he went out to an isolated place to do what? To pray. Before daybreak, before the rooster crowed, before the sun came up, the next morning Jesus got up, he went out to an isolated place to, a, to be by himself, basically, it says, to pray. Translation, thankful fruitfulness requires vine priority intentionality. Jesus is making sure that he's connected to the source. Who's the source? God the Father. Jesus, look at it. He's going before daybreak. The next morning, Jesus gets up, goes out to this isolated place to pray, to connect with his Father. To, he's God's the Father. He's, right, he's the mind. This is what we see next, verse 36. Later, Simon and the other disciples went out to find him. And when they found him, they said, Jesus, everyone is looking for you. In other words, Jesus, what are you doing out here in the wilderness by yourself? Don't you know that people are here? They want a, they want a piece of you. They're, they're here to hear from you. They're here to be healed by you. Jesus, what are you doing out here? There's ministry to be done. There's people's lives to be touched. There's stuff for us to do. What are you doing out here? That's basically what they're saying, but notice what Jesus says. Verse 38. He says, we must go on to other towns as well, and I will preach to them too. That's why I came. So we traveled throughout the region of Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. You know, I've asked this question to you before many times, and, but I think it's, it's worth repeating. A show of hands, how many of you have ever flown on an airplane? You know, when you, when you get on an airplane, you know the drill, right? The flight attendants get up and they say, here's where the exits are. And in the case, you know, the, we lose, uh, the lights go down. You know, the aisles are going to be lit with lights. And, and in an event that we lose cabin pressure, you're going to see this, uh, this mass that's going to drop out, right? And, and if in the event that you're traveling with a young child or a, someone who needs your help, grab, make sure you grab the mask and put the mask on them first, right? And then put it on yourself. That's what they tell you? No, what do they say? Put your own oxygen mask on first. Because if you're too busy trying to help your, your younger child or your, maybe your, your, uh, you know, an elderly parent or, or whoever it might be, your neighbor, and you pass out from lack of oxygen, chances are strong that they're not going to be able to help get your mask on you. And so what do they say? Put your own oxygen mask on what? First. And that's what we see here that Jesus is modeling for us. Early in the morning, we're told, long before daybreak, Jesus goes into the wilderness to pray. Friends, do you want to live a fruitful life? Then you got to stay connected to the vine. you got to stay connected to Jesus, which is one reason why you're here today, is it not? Or why you're tuning in online today, is it not? You know, when I celebrate Palm Harvest's 25th birthday, really, as I celebrate the last... 20, our birthday this year as I have celebrated the last 24 years, I can do so because Jesus has empowered me to stay engaged in, in ministry. And as we move forward in life, the question I ask you and the question I ask 
me is if, if we're, will you be deliberate about connecting to Jesus? Because if you are, I think there's a strong chance that Paul Marvis Church will, will be around for another 25 years. How many of you are going to be around with me for 25 years? Our ministry will have impact. Thankful fruitfulness requires vine priority intentionality. And so I challenge you, sisters and brothers, to say no to excuses. You say, Pastor Mike, I don't have time to read my Bible daily. Really? You say, Pastor Mike, I I'm too busy to get involved in a midweek Bible study. Really? Pastor Mike, I got a lot of responsibility. There's a lot of people that are looking to me. And I would say, you know, for, for help, and I would say outstanding. That's amazing. That's one of the reasons why you and I need to follow Jesus' example. Because thankful fruitfulness requires divine priority intentionality. Friends, you want to be successful for the long haul in your marriage, in your role as a parent or a friend, at your workplace, in your civic activities, then stay attached to the vine. We got to stay attached to the vine. So we're going to say several pr prayers together today. And one of them is we're, the first one I'm going to call it the help me prayer. So put everything down and let's do that right now. I want you to take a deep breath, hold it, exhale. Now with your palms open and your heart open, your mind open, simply just pray this in your heart. Say, help me, Jesus, to make time for you every day. Help me, Jesus, to practice vine priority intentionality. Deep breath in. Exhale. Good. Okay. Now skip forward to chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. Look at verse 1. When Jesus returned to Caper Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. Now stop here. Paul Marvis, the, the gospel writer, informs us that Jesus now returns to the town of Capernaum. The word gets out among the villagers that Jesus is in the hood. And what's the people's response? Where do they go? They were told that they fought toward the home where Jesus is staying, right? Now, whose home is Jesus staying in? What's the name of the homeowner? What's the Bible tell us here? What's the name of a homeowner? We don't know, do we? Why not? Because the Bible writer doesn't tell us. Now, we know that this isn't Jesus' home, because the Bible tells us in the Gospel of Mark or Matthew chapter 8 and Luke chapter 9 that Jesus himself says, I don't have a place to call home. He says, birds of the air have nests, you know, and foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. That's what Jesus said. So we know that this isn't Jesus' home, so whose home is it? We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But what we can deduce is that this home belonged to someone. Would you agree with that? And this someone made his or her, his or her home available to Jesus. Not only to sleep in, not only to cook a meal in and eat meals with his friends in, but also to be a place where he could invite visitors, right? That's what we're told here in verse Two, soon the house where Jesus was staying, we are told, was so packed with visitors that there wasn't room for one more person, not even outside the door. And herein lies the second secret for experiencing a fruitful ministry, ministry life, and that's this point number two. Thankful fruitfulness builds on sacrificial generosity. Thankful fruitfulness builds on sacrificial generosity. You know, when I review the history of our church, when I reflect on the last 25 years of ministry that we have shared together, my mind is flooded with memories 
of being in, in your home. You know, since the inception of our church, our community impact, really our community ministry has been built upon being in people's homes, largely because for the first 13 years of our, our, our existence, we never had a church campus like this that we could call home. We were meeting in the high school and we were tearing, tearing down and setting up and setting up and tearing down week after week after week after week after week. It just built within us this culture of, of serving our, our neighbor. But you know, in recent years, our men have gathered in the home of, of Steve and Robin Mensinker on Monday nights for a men's Bible study. Over the recent years, our women have gathered in the home of Nancy and Rick Capco on, on or our men's on Monday nights. The women are on Wednesday nights for a women Bible study. You know, we've enjoyed Sunday brunches in the home of Joe and Lisa Banning and Stephen Stephen, uh, Sheila Moello and David and Tanya Barrera and Kirk and Denise Bauermeister. We've even gathered in the home of Jim and Norma and, 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 you know, Mike and Robin Decker, all because of sacrificial generosity. Hospitality has played a role in the growth and the health of our church. Would you agree with that? And that's what we see here in this ministry of Jesus. Thankful fruitfulness builds on on sacrificial generosity. And so as we celebrate Paul Marvers Church, and I told Robin last night, we went for a walk, and I said, I think I'm just going to, I don't, I'm not a really good celebrator. I'm thinking we should probably should really do something significant for this silver anniversary. I think I'm just going to celebrate all year long. And just celebrate all year long what, what, what God has been doing. And really just to say thank you to all of you who have shared your home and shared your resources with this church because of you and your sacrificial generosity, much like this homeowner in Jesus' ministry, our church has community influence. You know, this past week, Steve treated, the Mensingers treated my family, Robin, myself, and our two adult daughters to uh, some tickets at, the, at the, a night out at the Honda Center where I could watch my beloved San Jose Sharks get beat by the Anaheim Ducks. You know, it was a life-refreshing evening, and I was telling Steve that after the first period when I went up to the top to... to, to uh, get some water and, and, and whatnot, I had one of the ushers say to me, excuse me, but my supervisor asked me not for you not to pound on the glass. And I said, is your supervisor a hockey fan? By the end of the night, everybody was pounding on the glass. It was, it was great. Steve won't get his season tickets next year, but it'll be because of... You know, over the years, Kirk Bauermeister has been tenacious about saying to me, Decker, let's go play golf. And he'll pull me out of the office and he'll, he'll invest some Bauermeister love in, into, into me with the goal of helping me stay renewed. And friends, what we read here in Mark chapter 2, the Bible writer showcases how Jesus' public ministry was supported and undergirded through the sacrificial generosity of a homeowner. We don't even know the name of this homeowner, but you know who does know the name of the homeowner? God the Father. Our Heavenly Father, and I believe that our Heavenly Father has a treasure chest of rewards and awards for those who sacrificially and secretly practice kingdom generosity. And so I invite you right now to just reflect on your own life. Maybe you want to go back the last 25 years as you cycle through. Who are the people in your life who have invested in you? Who are the people who have resourced you to help you get to this place, much like this homeowner did for Jesus? And maybe equally important to ask is who is God inviting you to invest in now? Anybody's name come to mind? I want us to pray another prayer together today. And so put your palms out again. Take a deep breath in. And I want you to think about this. I just, first of all, I want you to pray this in your heart. Say, thank you, Jesus, for those who've invested in me. Thank you, Jesus, for how you've invested in me through the generosity of others. And I want you to say, thank you, Jesus, for, and then you fill in the, the blank, the name of a person or persons who, have, who you know God has used to be an encourager to you. Thank you, Jesus, for who's the name of that person who believed in you when everybody was pounding on you, had given up on you.
Thank you, Jesus, for these people who have invested in my life over these years. Now pray this. Say, Jesus, please increase my willingness to be generous. Please in increase my willingness to be undergird palm harvest ministry with sacrificial generosity, even as I read about here in Mark chapter 2. So that, God, the next 25 years of our church will have influence. Please help me to be a sacrificial giver. Deep breath in. Exhale. Good. Now, in your Bible, skip forward here in Mark chapter 2 to verse 13. Mark chapter 2, verse 13. This is what we're told. Notice what we're told here about Jesus' ministry activity. Then Jesus went out to the lake shore again and taught the crowds that were coming to him. Now stop here for a second. Remember, Jesus got all these people coming at him. And we read how Jesus recognizes that he, he can't just keep putting out. He can't keep, keep just giving, giving, giving. And so he escapes. He goes, he takes time to put his own oxygen mask on. He, he goes away. He, he connects to the vine with incredible intentionality. God, you got to fill me up because people want a piece of me. And on my own, I can't, I can't give it to people. Then he goes to his house. He's looking for a little solace. I mean, how many of you look at your home as your kind of your, your, that's, that's your castle. That's the place where you go to be alone, right? Unless you're the messengers and you have people there every day. <laughs> but our home is our, our, is our castle. Jesus can't even get away because people are there. They want a piece of him. They, wanna, they want him to heal him. And now when he says, oh, maybe I'll just go for a walk. And as he goes out to the lake, again, people are there. They're looking for him. And he teaches the crowds that were coming to him. Verse 14. And as he walked along, Jesus saw Levi also known as Matthew, son of Alphaeus, sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up and followed him. Now write this down, point number three in your app notes. Thankful fruitfulness grows with teammate multiplication. Thankful fruitfulness, ministry fruitfulness, ministry Tenure will grow with teammate multiplication. You know, friends, the Bible writer informs us that Jesus has no problem attracting a crowd, does he? People are attracted to him. They come to the house where he is staying. They gather around him at the lake shore to hear him teach. Jesus has no difficulty gaining an audience. Kind of sounds like a Trump rally, doesn't it? Thousands of people gather to hear him preach. But notice how in the throes of popularity, Jesus still makes it his priority to, to build his ministry team, right? Come be my disciple, Jesus offers to Levi, the tax collector. Now, tax collectors, as most of you know, in Jesus' day, were considered sinners. They were Jewish by upbringing, they were Jewish socially, but tax collectors earned their living by working for the Roman government. And so they were, the, the tax collectors were shunned, don't miss this, by the Jewish religious churchgoers, by the Christians, if you will, but not Jesus. Rather, we read here how Jesus went against spiritual norms and in so doing, Jesus provides an example for all of us that even sinners, don't miss this, that even sinners are welcome on his ministry team. Somebody say amen to that. Any sinners in the house today? Yes, you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. And what this story models for us is Jesus wants you and he invites me to be a part of his ministry team and that our past doesn't need to determine what our future is. Thankful fruitfulness grows with teammate multiplication. You know, in the Old Testament, in the Bible, there's a story out of the book of Exodus chapter 18. And if you have a Bible there, you might, might want to turn there. 
But it's interesting, there's a story of Moses who has this, after he leads the nation of Israel out of, out of slavery, he's out in there, you know, making their way to the promised land, and his father-in-law, a guy by the name of Jethro, comes to visit him, and as he observes Moses' leadership activity, he realizes that Moses, much like Jesus, is overwhelmed by the demands of the people. Exodus chapter 18 describes a scenario where people are just standing in line waiting to talk to Moses so he can sort of help them navigate. He's like the judge in the land to help them navigate their, their d- disputes. And so Jethro says to, to Moses, he says, Moses, the way you're doing your leadership thing here, your style, it's not good because you're going to wear yourself out. You're going you're gonna, to, all of a sudden you're going to blow up and people are going to go, where's Moses? Well, he had a meltdown. How come he had a meltdown? It's because he was trying to do ministry all by himself. And so Jethro gives Moses some advice that Moses then heeds. And he says, son, appoint men and thou of, who, are, who can oversee people who have a capacity over thousands and hundreds and tens and let them navigate the needs of the people. And the ones that are really hard that even they can't navigate, he said, then you can tackle those. Ministry multiplication is going to be key, son, for you to continue advance forward and to fulfill God's calling on your life. Thankful fruitfulness grows with teammate multiplication. You know, friends, the health of our church and the effectiveness of our community ministry will be measurably influenced by your willingness to serve and help your pastor. Teammate ministry is a key to Palm Harvest Church effectiveness. So evaluate your our heart today. Are you a Palm Harvest shareholder? Are you someone who actively rolls up your sleeve? Or are you someone who tends to be more of a recipient? Someone who tends to maybe wait for others to serve you. You know, I have to tell people that when, if you see a need and you see something that needs to be done, do it because chances are nobody else sees it. That's why it's not being done. God's uniquely wired you to, to, with a skill set that I don't have or your neighbor doesn't have. And so oftentimes we see things and we can be critical of things, say, how come no one's doing anything about this? It's because they don't notice it, because God hasn't given them that skill set or that wiring to see that thing. He's given it to you. And if we as a church are going to be healthy, as we as a church are going to have a traction moving forward, we've all got to be willing to roll up our sleeves. That's what I believe the scripture teaches. You know, one of the people in our church family who I want to commend publicly right now is Ann Perry. Is Ann here? Did I see her in the back. She come, is Ann here, Chuck? So Ann's on here. Ann, you're probably watching it online. So let me just talk about Ann Perry. Ann, as you know, uh, you may or may not know, she leads our women's Bible study. And oftentimes, Ann and I will we'll talk. We'll, we'll text each other. I'll say, hey, Ann, here's, here's somebody I want you to pray for within the, 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 the sector of the women. And she'll respond back and she'll say, hey, Mike, did you know this? And she and I are both have this, we're, we've been developing this confidential relationship. And I've known Ann for, for many, 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 many years. Several, almost as long as the Palm Harvest Church uh, has been in 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 uh, existence. You know, Ann well, used to teach uh, CPR classes over at, at Estancia High School, and I would go as a chaplain, and I would get my CPR training from, from Ann long before she ever came to Paul Marvis. But Ann will frequently say, hey, Mike, have you heard the latest on Cheryl Kenahan, or have you heard the latest on, on Jerry Geislin, who both are two women in our church who are dealing with cancer, and, also, and we'll, just, we'll just confidently share bits and pieces. And I just want to commend Ann Perry because she has an ability to love on the women in her church in a way that I can't, nor do I really want to, because I'm a man. And she's a woman. And she's fulfilling really what we would call in, the, in, the, in biblical realms the role of a deacon or a deaconess. And if you want to know what the role is of a deacon or a deaconess, go to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and you'll say, yep, that's Ann Perry. 
Paul Marvin's church is healthier because of her kingdom ministry service. So thank you, Anne. Our church is healthier because of you. Where, friends, is God inviting you to step up and serve? Are you available? So let me just land the plane here. Let me move to point number four, and then we're going to go into a time of prayer again. So write this down, and then we'll read a couple more verses, and that's this. As I reflect upon ministry the last 25 years, and as I celebrate Palm Harvest Church's birthday, and as I look forward to the next 25 years of ministry that we get to be a part of, of setting the foundation for, I do so with this truth that thankful fruitfulness flourishes with mission tenacity. Thankful fruitfulness flourishes with mission tenacity. Look at what we're told here in verse 15. Mark chapter 2, verse 15. So Jesus is now out on the, out, he's right, he's been the, by the lake. He's called Math, or Matthew or Levi to be his disciple. Levi gets up, he follows him, and this is what we're told here in verse 15. Later, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. But when the teachers of religious law, who were Pharisees, saw Jesus eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I've come not to call those who think they're righteous, but those who know they are sinners. What's Jesus teaching us here, friends? What's Jesus' invitation to you and me? I've asked you this question before, and I will encourage you to answer it for yourself if you haven't already, is who are you uniquely wired to share the good news of Jesus with? Who is your who? This past week, I got an invitation to, to do a podcast with somebody for this next, and I said, I can't do it this week, I'm slammed. And they said, well, then I, they followed up here a couple days later and said, how about next week, which is this coming day? And I, as I, this morning, as I was getting ready, I thought, I really can't push this person away because they want to talk about voting and the importance of voting in this new election. And they said, Mike, you're a guy who's involved in our civic, in our city, and we, I, want, I feel like you have a voice that, that I think would be valuable for, for people to listen to, and I can't deny that truth because part of the who that God's called me to reach are people in civic circles, which is why I'm a police chaplain. And so I sent him a text. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm available on Tuesday. And right away, he came back and said, how about 8 a.m.? And so I said, per perfect. I'm unenthusiastically going to be on a podcast on Tuesday morning at 8 a.m. But it, that's my who. And when God says, hey, this is a who, and here's an opportunity for you to impact the people in your world, will you say yes in faith? Who is your Who? You know, right now in this election cycle, Robin Mensinger, one of our church Palm Harvest members, she is taking a step of faith and she's running for a position on our Newport Unified School District School Board. Now, I can't vote for Robin because she's not in my district and so I don't get the opportunity to, but I highly endorse her. Because when I look at Robin and I look at the scope of my relationship with her over these last several years, one of the things that you learn about Robin, if you don't know this, is she's, she's a special gal. Like when I first got to know her, I thought, she can't really be that nice, can she? Like how can she be so nice? But she is. God has uniquely wired Robin to love people with this capacity that very few of us have. But best of all about Robin as it relates to this, this, this faith step that she's taking to run for school board is she genuinely loves kids. Would you agree with that? How do you know that? Just look at how she's lived her life over the last several years. She's always serving in this snack bar at, at Estancia High School, and she's part of the booster program, and she's doing everything she can to make sure that kids have a voice, that she's an advocate for kids, and her life activities are colored with serving the youth in our city. 
But even better than that, Robin loves Jesus. And she takes her faith, and, she, and, and she, she's so generous, and she's so other people focused, and she's incredibly intelligent, and she's optimi- optimistically tenacious about making sure our kids have quality education. Is that accurate? Do you guys agree with that for those of you who know Robin? And so as a church, even though I can't vote for her, some of you can, and I would encourage you to, but even though I can't, you know what we all can do for Robin? We can pray for her. Because as a church family, God calls us in Scripture to be civically engaged. And maybe you can't be a police chaplain. Maybe you can't front for a school board position, but we can all pray. One of the ways that we can be engaged is by supporting Robin. Will you commit to pray for Robin? as we get close to the results of this election. You know, from the inception of our church beginning, Palm Harvest has been committed to raising up the next generation of leaders. It's part of our mission strategy. In his book, Old Paths, New Power, David Henderson writes, he says, leaders don't fall off of trees. Future generations are developed. They're developed through intentional, biblical, and transparent equipping. You know, currently one of the areas or arenas where we are intentionally striving to invest in the next generation, and I'm going to close with this illustration. Don't come up yet, David, but I'm getting close. Is by encouraging Joseph Gudino. You know, Joseph is, right? He usually stands back here playing the guitar. Joseph's now a freshman at Pacifica Christian High School. He's his budding electric guitar player. He invests hours every single day playing his guitar. And, you know, as, as the older bandmates, they go, wow, this kid is good. Like, yeah, he wor- but he works at it. But this kid is good. You know what Joseph's latest little musical endeavor is besides playing his guitar and by the way, he's an amazing runner. You're super fast. I've heard already that he may be breaking the, 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 the records next year. He's running like sub six minute miles. How fast are you running, Joseph? 508? That's just wrong. Hunter, did you ever run a 508 mile? <laughs> Close. How about you, Chuck? Well, besides running and besides playing his guitar, Joseph is putting together a worship team at his high school. And so throughout the month, I don't know if they're, it's weekly, but it's close, Joseph and his teammates, his band teammates, will meet in the Palm Harvest office in our studio, and, and, and Joseph, with the help of his dad, Beto, and, and David Barrera will come, and they will help set up equipment, and they'll tutor and mentor these these youth as they're striving to develop as as musicians and a worship team that maybe hopefully someday we'll get to have them up here on stage with Paul Marvis. Anybody would like that? Would that be a good thing? Why are we investing our time and energy into this next generation of youth? Because that's our mission priority. That's what our mission is that God calls us to have. Now because our campus is, is is utilized by five or six other churches in the evenings, this is like an ant colony. If you ever come around here, man, there are people everywhere. And so one of the consequences of having a lot of people on this campus and a lot of different activities is noise. And so trying to be good neighbors to our neighbors, one of the things that as a band, we try to eliminate the, the, the outside noise, so to speak, by using in-ear monitors. And you'll even see the bandmates. They'll have these you know, in-ear monitors. It just minimizes the noise. And so when you have a drum kit like this, drums make noise. And on Thursday nights when they practice, it makes noise. And so one of the things that we're trying to do to not only invest in our next generation of, of, of worship leaders, our youth as well as our own band members, which serves us every week, is we're gonna, we need to invest in a new drum kit that's electronic. They call it a, a Roland V-drum, for those of you who, who don't know what that is. And a, you know what a good drum kit costs? 
Costs about 4,000 bucks. So here's my closing landing invitation. I suggest that for November, we have a Thanksgiving offering with the goal of raising $5,000 that we're gonna use to invest in our youth band and sound equipment, mainly a V-drum electron, dr electronic drum kit so you can hear and they can hear, but everybody else doesn't get to hear because it's electronic, all with this effort to invest in the next generation of worship leaders. You know, when I reflect on my life, I'm 62 years old. And when I re reflect on my life, I can, my mind is filled with people who have invested in me. And my hunch is, is that as you reflect on your life, you probably can think of people who have invested in you. And so our mission as a church will continue to be a community that invests in the time, our time and talents in the next generation. And so if you, I'd love for you to just prayerfully consider how God might be inviting you to participate in this Thanksgiving offering, a goal of $5,000 to invest in this next generation of, of youth worship leaders. Why? Because thankful fruitfulness flourishes with mission tenacity. So let's close with one final prayer. Okay, so palms open. David, come on up. We're going to call this the God please use me prayer. Take a deep breath in. Exhale. Now pray this. Say, God, please use me. God, please use me. Now pray this. Say, God, please be with Robin Mensinger as she runs for school board. Pray this. Say, God, please be with Ann Perry as she invests her time into the women of our church. Pray this. Say, God, please use Joseph Gudino as he launches a new youth band at his school. God, please use me. God, please help me to be the homeowner in Jesus' story, the person who maybe people don't even know my name, but my time and my resources and my talents anonymously can still be used to be a part of your kingdom activity. God, please use me. Now finally pray this, say, God, please use us. Please use us as a church. Thank you for the 25 years, God, of, 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 of ministry that Palm Harvest has been privileged to be a part of. And we pray that the next 25 years will be even more fruitful, even more impactful on helping restore broken marriages, helping people turn from their life of sin into a life of, of fruitfulness and holiness as you transition that transform their lives through Jesus Christ. God, please bless us. Please use us for your kingdom glory. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. So thank you, Palm Harvest. Thank you for 25 years. I bless you today with increased capacity to be God's hands and feet. And like this, this engine in Jim's car, it's got so much power. I bless you with this ability, this renewed ability to tap into that power called the Holy Spirit to help you be his hands and feet in the name of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen and amen. Have a great week, everybody. God bless you.